Folks, we're back for section 22.3, seedless vascular plants. Now, at this point in what we've been going over, we haven't once talked about a seed. Okay, a seed is a very advanced thing. And I, I want to raise the topic of the seed when we look at advanced land plants. That's really the marker for advanced plants. At this point, what you've seen is something that produces spores and something that produces gametes, sporophytes and gametophytes. Now those concepts won't go away, but the idea of spores will evolve. So let's get going with phylum Terephyta, and this sort of illuminates the rest of the story. All right. So when we look at things that, that are the seedless vascular plants we think you know around the silurian era about the time the fish were really getting going okay 500 million years ago plants began to invade land okay and it was sort of freshwater chlorophyte algae and the reason why we're pretty certain of that when you look at the genetic analyses that's one piece of the picture in particular but we notice that it's green algae and they have a, a plentiful amount of chlorophyll A. And the more we look at land plants, we always see this prevalence of chlorophyll A. It's, it's like the workhorse of chlorophyll. And to get up on land, you would have had to have crept in probably for some pretty fresh water environments. And that's where you would have ended up surviving. You, uh, salt water wouldn't have always been a choice. Fresh water tends to be sort of a land-based water form. So 420 million years ago, if you go back in time to that time like that, you would be looking at um, interesting sort of like giant tree ferns and they, they really interesting structures. The thing about ferns is they're the first sort of plant critters that developed vascular tissue. So what do we mean by that? I'll tell you what we mean by that. By vascular tissue, we mean plumbing. It's that simple. You can transport water throughout the organism. That is absolutely vital because the further away a tissue gets from the ground, the greater the chance that it's going to dehydrate. So coming up with vascular tissue was the next important step. It's a really cool little graph here. Silurian, the, sorry folks, the Silurian era, sort of our fish time is here, and the age of uh, really around this point, it's a very wet period, well these both were extremely wet periods, that would have been the age of the uh, giant amphibian, and then we get into very dry periods where it's the age of the, the reptile, right, the amphibian that had the ability to, the mutant amphibian if you will, that had scales and could waterproof, sort of selectively protect its body. And it had eggs, which were chambers, which had their own internal watery environment. Very neat. The lizards were able to go far off into, um, into the land with that kind of a strategy. Right? They could survive without so much water. Not to say that they needed none. Now, in this graph, let's switch some colors, because purple's been done to death so let's go with some blue here as you see it begin to get drier you see that seed based the seed based plants begin to do exceptionally well and the reason for that is when you enclose your embryo inside of a seed like this it becomes waterproof think about it this way the dinosaurs came up with the amniotic egg it had a sack around it and protected their eggs from drying out. Seeds did the exact same thing. Seeds were going to be inevitable because the seed coat, also known as the testa, was a beautiful waterproof layer. So the seed plants really take off once that invention comes around. And there's internal food. And this is very different than the spores. Um, spores didn't have any of this. Never did. There we 
we go. So the internal food, or the endospore for the seed, was instrumental in its success, being able to survive, be carted around, grow up in new environments. That's what made the seed plants very, very advanced. But our ferns, well, if you look at them, they tended to do quite well. They didn't, they didn't really take off, but they had quite a wonderful branch of success here. Now, ferns, if you've ever gone out into the forest, you'll find ferns. I especially love this when I go to Tofino. You go out into the, into the rainforest and you'll see the ferns are very happy to be in that sort of dusky, sort of dark rainforest because they're not being hammered by that intense sunlight. And it's still nice and wet there. Pretty good sort of environment for them to live in. They don't get burned up in the sunlight because they their seeds sorry they don't have seeds they have spores their spores literally get carried lightly through the air because they're very light and when they land they just germinate and they'll try to grow up what we would know to be the gametophyte generation and we're going to meet that but there's no there's no fanciness of a seed to keep the spore going the spore has to start growing immediately and develop into whoop, into the gametophyte so let's take a look at that. What ferns were amazing, well, why ferns are amazing, is that they came up with this water piping. Now they're called tracheids, and you still see these in the softwoods. This is a neat little picture right here. They're little water conductive pipes. And if you zoom in on them, look in really closely, they're pitted. All these little pits. And that allows water to enter into them. And they've got these little end plates. Sort of, you can sort of think of these as little screens that the water will pass through. Now, when you look at how thick they are, they have cellulose reinforcing around the outside. So they're pretty strong. They're not as strong as what you see evolve later. You could think of them as pretty thick for now, but they were going to, what was to come was going to be even more reinforced. And we call the ones with very thick walls, a lot of the flowering plants are like this, the cherry trees and the likes of our uh, oaks. They have, uh, Instead of these, they have these very reinforced. In hardwoods, you'll see, I'm sort of giving away here, but in hardwoods, you'll see these tremendous, large, sort of circular pits, and those are like huge water conducting vessels. That's sort of like generation two. But for now, you're looking at soft fiber. And you've probably heard of. Uh, pine and things like that being called softwoods. If you ever take a, a pine two by four and whack it with a hammer, you'll leave a dent because pine is a pine just has these kind of tubes in it. These ones that we call tracheids. So generation one. Let's make a note of that. It's very important. The generation one pipe system is known as the tracheids. Xylem is a term that you need to know and commit it to memory right now, do yourself a favor, that is the kind of piping that conducts water. Think to yourself, what kind of piping might there be for something else? Well, plants do photosynthesize. How would they move the sugar up and down their stems? Now think really hard. Think about it for a second. If you like maple syrup, wait a minute. The plant in the summer photosynthesizes, sends all the sugar down to the roots, and then in winter brings it back up. And it's in winter when we tap just underneath the bark. And we tap underneath the bark because there's another set of pipes just underneath there. They don't conduct water, they conduct sugar. And in the case of the maple tree, we're famous for it in Canada, we pull off some of that maple sugar and concentrate it to make maple syrup. So there's two types of piping. 
the one that conducts water is called xylem. So you need to conduct, uh, <laughs> commit that to memory. The other one that will come up will be called phloem, and it conducts food. Has an F sound, phloem, you get the idea. And here it is. So let's highlight that. Phloem, pH for food, and we know that plants' food is sugar. I'll hit done here. So through the process of photosynthesis, all you have to do is follow this down, and you'll see that the plant, oops, there we go, needs to nourish itself. So it, it, it tends to store a lot of its sugar down in the roots and call it back up when it needs it, selectively. Water is typically going in the other direction because water needs to get up to the leaves, so they've chosen a good color. Comes in through the root tips, and there's a neat process we'll talk about for water to rise this high up, and it leaves and it transpires or evaporates out through the leaves because water is needed for photosynthesis in the leaf structure itself. Plants are also busy doing a little bit more. We know in photosynthesis, or we should, that the plant takes in carbon dioxide. Let's, hmm, takes in carbon dioxide. That's what it makes sugar with. That's the carbon source. And it releases oxygen. Now that's technically stripped away from water. If you must know, that's a really neat process. If you think about the H2O and the CO2, give you a little, let's grab another color. There we go. Put these together. And if you think there's the carbon and there's the H2O, I'm going to reduce this for you. These are all factors of six. Carbon. H2O. Now I'll throw in the ones that you don't need them, but do you see it now? You can see where the carbon's coming from, and you can see that the water is being combined with it to produce carbohydrates. And that's the origin of the word. That's exactly what it means. Let's zoom out now that I made a big old mess. So since phloem conducts food, it can conduct it up and down. Now, when we look at the advanced plants, there's a very, very neat trick for that. But for now, you need to make two important distinctions. There's a set of pipes for conducting water and a set of pipes for conducting the food stuff or the sugars of the plant. If, if it helps, xeros means dry and plants are trying not to dry out. Maybe that'll help you with xylem. Phloem is easy. It just, it's got a fuss sound or always reminds me, always did, of food. So I always knew xylem had to be the other one. How about those mental tricks? Now xylem and phloem, when you think about it, when xylem is conducting water up, that's typically what it always does, how can it overcome the forces of gravity? I mean, that's, it's pretty heavy. Every liter of water weighs one kilogram. Now that's no small feat, that's 2.2 pounds. So let's put it this way. 100 kilograms of water is 220 pounds. And some plants can move hundreds of liters of water up their stems over the course of just a few days. Large trees in the rainforest do that. In fact, a lot of the rainforest trees will produce clouds. They make their own clouds, it's amazing. So you think about throwing in some sugar and getting a sticky solution, how can we move that stuff? Let's start with water first. I think that's the easiest thing to describe. And I think I will just draw it. Um, actually, I just want to take a quick peek here. Nope, it doesn't discuss it here. And if you're going to introduce it in Act 1, you better explain it by Act 2. That's my motto. So I'm going to zoom in because that gives me plenty of room. And if we look at water, there's six reasons why water can move up in the plant. So first of all, reason number one, 
Oops. Undo. There we go. Let's move this over for a sec. Number one, what you've got. Is it going to be good for me? I think it will. Just have to be nice. Number one. The roots which absorb the water, there we go, are pushing upwards. In fact, the roots tend to trap the water and they won't let it out. So the water begins to build up. So you've got root pressure pushing upwards. Okay, so that's the first source of, of what it takes to push water up a plant. But that's not enough. Second one is that, oops, why is this jumping around on me? Water is sticky. So we'll say that it is cohesive. Water is very cohesive. And that means that water, if you've ever put water in a glass, you can put water in a glass or just about anything. Put it in a wooden bowl. Try to shake all of the water out. Sure, you can get rid of most of it, but there will always be water sticking to the container. Water is, if you look at the chemical nature of water, it has a charged end on e kind of each of its sides. Water, I think I can draw it down here. You might have seen, kind of looks like Mickey Mouse. And the hydrogen ears, and this is oxygen here, the hydrogen ears are a little bit positive and oxygen is a little bit negative. And if you think back, uh, we used to go over this a lot in Science 10, this, uh, just rub a balloon against your hair and stick it up against a neutral structure like the wall. In fact, it'll stick, charged things will stick to neutral structures. They're, they're attracted to them. So water particles, if we zoom in, maybe we can make this look cool. There we go. You think of our little water molecules as sticking. And they'll, they'll stick, you can have it like this. They'll stick to the edge of the container. So they tend not to fall down. So they're cohesive. So that's another one. Water molecules are cohesive. They, they stick just enough to the edges to not fall down. So that sort of helps. The roots are pushing up. The water molecules are kind of cohesive. Kind of makes sense. Now, if you look at water, water molecules are also adhesive. Like they're, 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 they're very sticky. Water molecules will stick to each other. So if these are, if this is Mickey's chin, which is negative, and the ears, which are positive, we say that water is it's neat. It's it's a dipole. And what that means is, as the water is moving up, some of the water molecules will be attracted. Let's go like this. The next water molecule would be attracted in this manner because its positive end is attracted to the negative end. Let me put it this way, if you've ever been to Disney. When it comes to water molecules, Mickey's chin being negative is attracted to another Mickey's ears because they're because positive and negative attract. So we've got that. So water molecules are um, not only cohesive, they're adhesive. All right. Gosh darn pen. Give me trouble tonight. Looking for a better pen. Adhesion. Okay, so we got cohesion, we've got adhesion. Okay, so sticking together, sticking to the container, we kind of get that. They're being pushed up by root pressure, but then there's another one that you have to consider. And we have to choose a different color for this. Okay, so let's go with a uh, green color. The leaves up here, the leaves in most plants, I know we're talking about ferns and things like that, but I'll use, I'll just talk about leaves because it makes it a little easier to discuss. The leaves 
in this case, the water as it travels up is leaving. It's evaporating. Now that's a special kind of evaporation that we call transpiration. That is kind of like, uh, kind of creates a little bit of mini suction. And if every leaf does this, it's pulling. So you can think of it as the opposite of the roots. The roots are pushing, but the leaves, the leaves are pulling. So that's, that's a drawing pressure, almost, almost sort of like a vacuumous pull. And between the four, um, these four mechanisms, even giant sequoia, and they're enormous, those are hundreds of feet high, can pull water from the fine root tips and using root pressure, cohesion, adhesion, and then at the very last, using this little trick with evaporation that we call transpiration, transpiring, the water leaves the plant. All the way from the root tips up to the leaves. And it's pretty amazing when you consider that plants are using the physical characteristics, chemical characteristics of water to help transport water all the way up. That's pretty impressive. So I wanted to make sure I went over that. Interesting drawing, sorry. Glad you put up with my awkward little drawing, but that's how it goes. Okay, so what do we have here? Seedless vascular plants. These are the guys that produce spores. So let's make a little note. All right. These are our spore producers. Boring little spore like that, right? Which will germinate and grow into these tangled filaments till it reproduces the gametophyte. These guys will do it. So our club mosses. Our horsetails, literally they look like it, acrocetium, and our ferns, which we all know and love and should be fairly familiar with. Ferns are just such a great example. You talk about club mosses and some people pick them up, they're nice, you can you can have them to sort of ornamental and horsetails, you see those around bogs and things like that, pretty wet near the edges of lakes. But ferns, yeah, when you talk ferns, that's a really good example. I like this picture because you look at these sort of colossal sort of tree ferns. And what was neat about ferns is there was no more messing around anymore. They started to get these things that look more like true roots. Not those, uh, well, you'll still see the roots referred to as, as, as rhizoids. About the time you look at something like a, uh, oh, I think about a, uh, uh, something like a pine tree, you look at its roots, it's got true root structures. There has to be quite a bit of, of tissue proper for roots. But ferns and their relatives, they started to come up with those true sort of root-like structures and their leaves, proper leaves and stems, not just green structures sticking up in the air. And I have a whole lesson on roots, stems and leaves that you have to take in because it really nails the topic. Roots, leaves, stems, they're very distinct because they have very distinct jobs. Okay, so what do we have here? If we look, first thing I'm going to let you know is that this is the, oh, stop that. This is the sporophyte part of a fern. And I apparently keep pressing something. And the gametophyte technically is down here. There's a little plant down there that you never see called the gametophyte. Not unless you know what you're looking for. I T E. <laughs> there we go. So the sporophyte, when you look at a fern, you look at those nice fronds, and you say, well, that's pretty nice, ornamental. You know, you put it with roses, things like that. But there's technically two life cycles going on. Moss was just, uh, moss was was much more sort of obvious. When you look at that green stuff, that's all the gametophyte. It's hard to miss. Now, you look at the at, at a fern, and really you're looking at the sporophyte almost all the time. The sporophyte starts to become more dominant as land plants sort of become more sophisticated. 
There we go. The stems, see they're sort of, they, they have these strong roots. Uh, come here, you. There we go. Good vascular tissues, underground stems. Now these underground ones, we call them rhizomes. It's sort of like, uh, if you look at strawberry plants, they'll send out a runner. Now that's sort of like a lateral stem, right? Rhizome, you'll hear that quite a bit. And these guys up here, we call the fronds. So there's our, if I labeled the gametophyte, but if there was, if it was sending off sort of a shoot, we would call that the rhizome. And now when you look at this, you see these sort of fibrous roots, right? These aren't rhizoids. These are very good structures at collecting water and retaining water. And the leaves we call fronds, lots of little leaflets. So unlike what we saw before, and I've already said this, the diploid sporophyte is dominant. When you look at those fronds, holy smokes, there's your sporophyte. If you've ever turned the, uh, the fern frond upside down, you see all these little black specks. And that is where the spores are being produced. It's always neat to take a look. So we do that in the lab. And here it is. So since these things are producing spores, lots of them, they're spore producing structures, we call them sporangia. Now you have to zoom in on the sporangia. You can't just say, oh, this is good enough. You know, it's sort of looking at it magnified like this, you can see there's something fuzzy going on there. In fact, up here, get a real good look at it. So you think, well, what does that look like magnified? And you zoom out over here, and then you say, wow, that's, oop, give it a second to zoom in there. And you look at all these little clusters, all these little things here. And it's like, well, these are all like little heads. So from the side, they kind of look like this. And there's lots of them sticking up. Like that. And it's, and there's no word of a lie. It's in the tips, the sporangium, plural sporangia, where meiosis is going on, and we're going from 2n to 1n, going from diploid to haploid, so that when the spores get released, they can make new baby gametophytes. And it keeps the life cycle going around and around in a happy circle. really neat when you look in on it. Um, they did a great job of showing off the sporangia here and inside of each one of those that's sort of where the business of meiosis is going on. So up close and then really up close. Each one of the little spore producers is is a sporangium plural of sporangia. So what do we call the whole cluster the whole get together here? We say that this whole thing right here, this whole structure, each one of these, is a saurus. And a saurus is made up of lots of sporangia. So now you've kind of got a little anatomy lesson under your wing. I know, more stuff to memorize, eh? Well, it's biology. But it's, it's information in passing. I really want, what I want you to know, yeah, know the names, but know what's going on with this alternation of generation. Because this trick carries on in the plant kingdom for quite some time. Okay, so now we get into a complex lurking fern life cycle. It's not really that bad. Let's pop out of this for just one second. We'll come back to it. I promise. There we go. And we'll come back here because I had loaded this. We saw this in the last um, in the last video. So what you've got is your sporophyte. So we'll start with that. And these right here, kind of neat. If you've ever heard of fiddleheads, they're baby ferns and they're coiled up like this and they can be gathered and put into stews, exotic soups, things like that. Uh, some people get paid a lot of money for collecting these and delivering them uh, to market. You can see that this fiddlehead is maturing and it's growing up into a frond, right? Not so succulent. You have to wonder, well, what is this? 
what the heck is that thing? What are they growing up on? Unlike Moss, where it was really obvious the Gamita fight was green, and that's probably what you saw most of the time, you almost never see the Gamita fight. It's, it's interesting. It starts out looking sort of like a heart-shaped sort of leaf on the forest floor, and then after reproduction happens, the female structures start to grow these once they're fertilized. So we saw that before in the moss where fertilization went on in the tip. In this case, it's not the tip, but in these little reproductive areas where all the eggs were. But we'll get to that pretty quick. Nice little zoom in here. Oop. There's your saurus. This is called a sporangiophore in case you wanted to know. This little four just means stalk-like. So there's our spores being released. And at this point, remember that this thing is haploid. It's the product of meiosis. So it grows up, and there we go. So this is a neat point to pause it, by the way. This is known as the prothallus when it's just a little one. And once it grows up, it becomes sort of this, well, sort of becomes this heart-shaped structure, which we call the, we don't call it a prothallus, we call it a thallus. Between you and me, pro means before. It just means an, it just means an early version of. Once this gets going, there we go, we get a thallus. Now, it's interesting because it's got male and female structures. The, I believe it's the female structures up here, and the male structures are a little bit more south because it doesn't want to fertilize itself. And they'll mature at different times so that you would fertilize a neighboring plant and not yourself. Plus, you want to create a little geographic distance, so just in case there's not a problem with self-fertilization, which would defeat the whole point of sexual reproduction. There we go. Haha. -ha. So, up here in the notch of the thallus, there's the egg in its archegonial chamber, and down here, sperm-producing structure, we call those antheridia. Now that's kind of interesting. This isn't, that wouldn't be entirely accurate whoop, because it wouldn't want to fertilize itself. So what should have been shown in the animation is, an, is in, uh, a neighboring plant fertilizing this one. We'll let that go, but what we'll see happening here is that the gametophyte, which is haploid or 1N, starts to have fertilized structures growing up on it and the thallus is parasitized it just it just degenerates and the sporophyte lives off it so this gametophyte here isn't the powerful sort of photosynthetic structure that we saw with moss look at how green this thing is you can see that this is going to become the dominant part of life cycle the photosynthesizer this certainly does help with rooting though and we're kind of right back to where we were before you can do a little we could do a little game here, but more or less we've seen what we needed to see. So now, when we look back at our notes, I'll turn our reflection back on. So now when you look at a life cycle like this, it's really not that bad. In fact, start at the same spot. Now there's purple and orange differentiating. The purple is the sporophyte or 2N part of the life cycle. Okay, so it's alternating generations, right? It's alternating between sporophyte and gametophyte. And the only way you get alternation of generations is when you have multicellular critters. That's why, if you think back quite a long time ago, Chlamydomonas, which was a unicellular algae, was kind of doing this, but it wasn't multicellular. So it wasn't technically alternation of generation. Interesting, all these definitions. However, we'll start with the generation, which is 2N right here. Spores released, so we should put meiosis. Oop, yeah, I lost that. Erased it on me. Meiosis. 2N goes to 1N. Terrible N. There we go. 
So here's your spores that are haploid and they grow up into your little baby gametophyte. There we go. The gametophyte is haploid. They're going to let me... No, it doesn't see that as text. There's your gametophyte right there. Now this reproduction has to happen in water. In fact, they're kind of shaped this way. They're, uh, when rainwater hits them and it, it strikes and they're splashing, you'll get fertilization between neighboring plants. So in the antheridia, the male parts, maybe we should just put a little male symbol over that. What the heck was that? Hmm. It's, I think I'm just going to have to hit done. Interesting. It's jumping all over the place on me. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm just going to have to go with it, folks. The antheridia, which is the male part here, and the egg. So let's make sure you're aware of that. Antheridia there. Archegonia, the female parts are up here. Now, it doesn't self fertilize. That would be sort of self defeating. So neighboring plants fertilize, right? And you get the zygote forming here. And that, I like that they used a dark green color because it really differentiates it well. That begins to grow up and becomes our new sporophyte right there. So sorry for that little mess that that made there. Interesting. My pen's giving me trouble. So there you go. There's the fern gametophyte. Female structures here. Male structures tend to reproduce, tend to be a little bit lower down in this region. And it's smart to keep them separate. This right here, I'd be sort of looking at it, this looks pretty young. It's probably, well, it's not a thallus. It's, it, it's a prothallus. It depends. It's hard to tell based on the size. It's pretty small, so I'm going to go with prothallus. But there you go. That is the alternation of generation that goes on in a terophyte. Phylum terophyta, p, tero, there you go. Here's a little hint. When you see phyta like that, definitely know that you're looking at a phylum, okay? Now, oh, I should say, in botany, oh, botanists would catch me on this all day long. We're supposed to say a division. When we look at plants in botany, instead of phylums, they say divisions. That's okay. I can speak that language, too channel my inner botanist so division terrified i'm good with that too okay folks have a good one mr b out